Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, December 28, 2011 edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. Now, coming up tonight, we have a powerful interview with Colonel Craig Roberts. He was involved in the Oklahoma City bombing investigation, and he's going to break down all kinds of aspects of this important case, as detailed in the film A Noble Lie. We carry it. I've seen it. It's incredible. We'll talk more about that later. But tonight, it is less than a week away from the Iowa caucuses, leading off the vote for the 2012 GOP primaries. And even as Ron Paul continues to lead in Iowa, Gingrich unloads on Paul worse than Obama, saying, I think Barack Obama is very destructive to the future of the United States. I think Ron Paul's views are totally outside the mainstream of virtually every decent American, Gingrich said Tuesday in a CNN interview with Wolf Blitzer. I can name a few decent Americans he didn't take into account, wouldn't put him on the list. Could Gingrich vote for Paul? No, if it came down to Paul versus Obama, he'd have a very hard choice to make at that point, he says. And he brought up all kinds of things uh, after he himself was attacked by Ron Paul's campaign as a serial hypocrite. Uh, he blasted, Gingrich blasted Paul's record of systematic avoidance of reality uh, and called him unthinkable as president, uh, said he's a person who thinks the U.S. was responsible for 9-11 a person who wrote in his newsletter that the World Trade Center bombing of 93 might have been a CIA plot. Well, it's on tape, Gingrich. You're the one who can't deal with reality and says it doesn't matter if the Iranians have a nuclear program, even if it's going to raise the price of oil and drive us into World War III. Whatever you say, Gingrich, everyone's listening to you, even as Paul holds a slim lead over Romney in the first Christmas post-Christmas Iowa poll that's in the Hill uh, where they report with the Iowa caucus one week away, Ron Paul is standing his ground in Iowa, according to a public policy poll released Wednesday, leading the field with 24%, Romney closely behind at 20%. Then if you look at the actual public policy poll, Newt Gingrich has slid from at one time leading at 27% to 22% to 14% and then 13% over the course of four consecutive polls uh, throughout a month, so he's really just drowning, and he has a very unfavorable view as well. While Ron Paul has the solid voters, he has the uh, independent and Democratic voters who are going to vote in Iowa, he has the young voters, and he has that lead over Romney, but let's wait and see if they steal it from him. They've already laid their plans to ignore Iowa if Ron Paul wins. Surely they won't do that if Romney ends up winning, which is also a possibility. Um, as artificial as he may be as a candidate. Meanwhile, even more serious news, Iran promises to close down oil route if sanctions imposed. Uh, for the second time in two days, Iran has threatened to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, Hormuz if new sanctions are imposed in response to its nuclear program. If they can impose sanctions on Iran's oil exports, then even one drop of oil cannot flow from the Strait of Hormuz, Rahimi said. Of course, they're doing drills there now to do just that, and they've said it's very easy. The Strait of Hormuz is the only access point for eight Gulf Arab states producing oil for foreign markets. It's the world's most important oil choke point, according to the U.S. Department of Energy. And so that will just totally escalate things in a World War III. That's, of course, if the U.S. goes through with sanctions as planned. Uh, in the weeks past, Paul Watson and many other reporters uh, talked about how oil would skyrocket to three to even $500 a barrel if they close the Strait of Hormuz as Iran has uh, routinely played on the card because they can't get a fair hearing in the world uh, court system of public opinion. Seemingly, anyway. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Meanwhile, Montanans organized to remove senators who voted for traitor's detainment bill. There's a recall clause in Montana and I believe eight or nine other states, depending on exactly which details you look at. One thing is clear with the passage of the legislation, National Defense Authorization Act, it is those senators and congressmen who voted for its passage that are violating their oaths to support and protect the Constitution of the United States because everything in the bill is counter to the principles outlined in our founding document. As such, concerned citizens around the country are now actively pursuing grassroots efforts to utilize never-before-enacted power of the people, the recall of federally elected senators and other officials. Of course, the NDAA bill has been blasted 
for just completely doing away with the Sixth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Seventh Amendment, the Eighth Amendment, and continuing to damage the Fourth Amendment as well, of course, along with any other amendment they can come across. Now, while the Montana Constitution and those of other states allows for a recall to take place, there is some question about whether those powers uh, will be recognized if taken to federal court because they're not explicitly defined in the U.S. Constitution, but of course all those powers are reserved to the states where they're not given to the federal powers. Other states who can also recall senators as well as congressmen who voted for the NDAA include Arizona, Colorado, Louisiana, Michigan, Nevada, North Dakota, Oregon, Wisconsin, and from what I looked at, it looked like Washington as well. New Jersey's on that list, but it was struck down in New Jersey. Something to keep an eye on at any rate, a recall effort would send a clear message to Washington that the people are upset about what they've done, and they know what's going on, and they're not happy about it. So I think in that respect, it's something worth supporting, whether or not it actually came into full fruition. Now, you've heard about MF Global and the very controversial John Corzine. He was, of course, a Goldman Sachs executive. He was also a senator and governor in New Jersey, and we have more developments there. Uh, of course, we have Vice President Joe Biden just in an absolute love fest of John Corzine saying they were relying on him in the opening days of the Obama administration to fix the economy, even though their firm MF Global cannot account for $1.2 billion, which they uh, transferred overseas into other banks and so forth. But they say they can't find the money. Uh, let's play some of those Biden clips right now. Before we were sworn in, when Barack Obama and I were literally sitting at a desk in a high-rise in Chicago, beginning to plan how we would try to get this economy out of a ditch, literally, the first guy I called was John Corzine. What did we talk about? The first question they wanted to raise with us is whether we might have to call a bank holiday, a bank holiday, on our, the day after we were sworn in. Ladies and gentlemen, the president and I weren't back there blaming John Corzine. They know what we were doing. We were on the phone calling John Corzine. Now, it shouldn't be a big surprise that they were calling John Corzine to fix these problems since he was slated to be probably the next Secretary of the Treasury after Geithner. First, they put in a Federal Reserve guy, then an out and out Goldman Sachs guy. It's all a close circle. Uh, but there's even more ties as the Washington Times exposes the MF Global chief missing $1.2 billion, who's also a financial advisor to the EPA. Of course, the EPA has become very controversial for its plans to put absolute economic sanctions on Americans over energy policies, shut down power power plants, coal plants, tax Americans just to unbelievable levels, you know, tax light bulbs, to have home inspections, all this stuff we've heard about under the bills that they passed and tried to pass, uh, didn't go all the way through. But at the head of that effort is Lisa Jackson, head of the EPA right now. Who was she? But chief of staff to John Corzine in New Jersey when he was governor. She was also the head of New Jersey's EPA at one point. And then this article brings up MF Global's current chief operating officer, Bradley Abelo, who was prior to Lisa Jackson, the chief of staff for Governor John Corzine. So interesting little circle there. Now, the Washington Times article gets into how uh, Bradley Abelo has not disclosed and how they haven't asked questions about in Congress his ties to the EPA as the chief financial advisor. He is the chairman of its financial advisory board and advises on the spending of $8.6 billion for this bloated government agency that looks for more and more money, how to tax Americans into oblivion through what I've already called economic sanctions. And then we have the quote here, even as he finds himself the public face of a bankruptcy and admitted to lawmakers that he had no idea how client funds disappeared, Congress and the administration have voiced no public concern about Mr. Abelow's role advising the 8.6 billion government agency on its finances. Uh, but what's going on here, besides whether or not they ask questions to this Bradley Abelow, is why the Obama administration has not only the Chicago mob, but apparently this New Jersey and Goldman Sachs mob in its midst. Bradley Abelow is not only chief of staff for Governor John Corzine, he was also a top Goldman Sachs executive. Many people at the time 
questioned how he could even become the chief of staff as he had no relevant political experience but only banking experience. And now you see what happens when you put these financial firms in charge of the economy and what direction that goes. Interesting to see the EPA ties to MF Global come to a head between Lisa Jackson, currently in Obama's White House as EPA and head administrator, and Bradley Abelow, now chief of MF Global that can't account for the money. Now, in a totally different subject, uh, I've done a lot of eugenics research here uh, with Alex. I've read literally hundreds of publications, looked at everything, and this is the first time I've ever seen in detail a single-page smoking gun document that just covers so much of it. Everything you've heard about eco-science, which was published in 1977 from the White House, uh, uh, science advisor John P. Holdren, uh, is outlined here in this 1969 document. It's a, a private secret memo to Bernard Berelson, who was president at the time of the Population Council, which was founded by John Rockefeller III in 1950s, to the president, or from rather, the president of Planned Parenthood World Population, Frederick S. Jaffe. Jaffe's the one who wrote this memo, and it outlines proposed measures to reduce U.S. fertility uh, by universality or selectivity of impact. That means ways they're going to constrain the population. Now, of course, they've been doing this in third world countries for decades, but this key document came out only a couple of years uh, before they started arguing in 1971 for Roe versus Wade, uh, effectively legalizing abortion in this country, which would later become a tool to target particularly the black population, but also all kinds of Americans, uh, now more than 50 million aborted babies in this country. Anyway, what's important in this document is how they specifically target the family and even talk about putting fertility control agents in the water supply. Why do we have all this BPA, all these pharmaceuticals, all these weird substances and the fluoride as well in the water? Why do we have all these bad chemicals in our food, all the genetically modified problems they know about but won't stop and keep pushing through with automatic regulation in the FDA? because they want to lower the population. They've been doing it across the country, across the world. Now they want to do it in this country. They've been doing it actively since 69. It talks about restructuring the family, getting people to postpone or avoid marriage, altering the image of the ideal size of family. It talks about compulsory education of children, encouragement of increased homosexuality. Right here on paper, I'm not making this up, people. Educate for family limitation, fertility control agents in water supply. It's right here on this memo. Came out in this Frederick Jaffe's uh, papers while he was at Planned Parenthood years later. It, and it also encourages women to work. So they can't be at home uh, taking care of their families and having more babies. Instead, they must go to work. But they're not going to treat those women well, according to this document. They're going to do everything they can to take away the tax incentives for married couples, for people with more than two children. It says right here, under a, a subject I don't even understand, chronic depression, uh, it says require women to work and provide few child care facilities, eliminate limit and eliminate public finance, medical care, scholarships, housings, loans, subsidies, everything uh, for families with too many children. And it even talks about having permits to be allowed to have children, limiting childbirth to only a certain sector of adults, and compulsory abortion for out-of-wedlock pregnancies. Whether or not you think some of these ideas individually might be advisable because you think there's too many people, this is draconian authoritarianism, and they tried to bring it to America. It was written about in eco-science, but as I'm going to show you in these clips, it was practiced in countries including China. China is the world model for the stuff that's on this document for the United States. Before they had the one-child policy, they had their family planning programs, which is part of the Worldwide Planned Parenthood group, uh, advising people, encouraging them, using propaganda, loudspeakers, everything to get people to have first only two children, first to delay their marriage, but then as you see, later to only be allowed to have one child at the penalty of the police state's gun. Uh, let's play some of those clips right now from the Barefoot Doctors of China in 1975, four years before the one-child policy. One of the most important aspects of China's family planning campaign is providing jobs for women. Women comprise 80% of the employees at this lock factory. 
The factory's barefoot doctors keep track of the women's menstrual cycles and deliver birth control pills at the proper time. Okay, stop it right there. So I just want to point out they have admitted they're encouraging women to work as a major plank of their family planning program and even regulating their menstrual cycles. Uh, we think this is okay. No, it's a scientific takeover of humanity. Uh, they are restricting the natural birth cycle of humans, whether or not you think there's too many people or whatever. I don't think we want a authoritarian scientific dictatorship in charge. Let's go on with the clips, please. The government encourages late marriages and small families. There it is from this document. Postpone or avoid marriage. Alter the image of the ideal family size. Keep going, please. Parents should have only two children, with a recommended spacing of four years. And these are short clips. We have longer ones uh, posted on InfoWars, including in the article I wrote over the weekend, China slave state where the family is outlawed and the rich breed in secret. That's right, in the one-child state, the rich are having test tube babies eight at a time in this particular case. But the bigger point here is that you've got this Planned Parenthood mechanism and the Rockefeller Foundation-funded Population Council producing these uh, propaganda videos and encouraging these publications where they're trying to brainwash the population into having fewer children and for the state to dictate how many children you could have. That's the key. The state is who decides uh, what kind of family you should have. And that's why this is so alarming, especially when it comes to putting fertility control agents in the water supply and hormonally changing people, including in encouraging homosexuality. I mean, it's just nightmarish what this government and their related NGOs and the United Nations uh, foundations like UNESCO think they can do to us. I know Alex has covered this in depth. I don't want to get too much into it, but it, this is a shocking document, and you will find it at InfoWars.com. We cover it in depth there. Uh, now, when we come back from break, we have that exclusive interview with Colonel Craig Roberts. It's going to be dynamite, but first we want to play a short clip from him in the film A Noble Lie on the Oklahoma City bombing of 1995. This is a powerful film. I've seen it for myself. I was blown away. I cannot recommend it enough. We have it here at InfoWars, but we've been selling out because people are so interested in this topic right now. Uh, so get it and share it with other people, then buy more copies to support the filmmakers. Uh, again, that's at InfoWars.com. Let's go to that clip of Colonel Craig Roberts right now. Day one, hour two of the bombing, the most significant event that happened is when they said they found other bombs in the building. The second most significant event was that they moved everybody back and held them back. There were still people alive trapped in the building, but they came in with two trucks and backed them up to the Murrah building and a bunch of these uh, guys dressed in blue jackets with no letters on the back started taking boxes of files out and putting them on this truck. And it was during this time that uh, early in the investigation that I, I started receiving some various phone calls. Uh, one of them was a, a phone call from Little Rock, Arkansas. The guy said that he was a federal agent. He was not an FBI agent. He was not uh, ATF. But what he did say was, during their investigation of the Clintons, uh, on the, all the drug running that went through Mena, Arkansas, and you know Lassiter's Ranch, and all of that stuff that was going on at the time during Iran-Contra, that those records, when, when uh, uh, Clinton went to Washington, were transferred from there to the Murrah building. Of course, the other Achilles heel is the videotapes of the building itself from the different surveillance cameras that no one's seen. If McVeigh, uh, was Lee Harvey McVeigh all by himself, the lone nut with the truck, then why don't they show us the videotapes of the truck? Show us the videotapes of him getting out, or was there more than him in the truck? And that's just a short clip, folks. I mean, this whole Oklahoma City thing is not only an inside job, it is a conspiracy. It's cold-blooded murder. It's just unbelievable. you got to see the, the section they have on Terrence Yakey. Uh, but that is all coming up with Colonel Craig Roberts. I want to remind you, at PrisonPlanet.tv, there's another 15-day free trial. You can try it out, see all the great things you get. And then you can choose to get a membership and support us and this broadcast. Help us get the word out all at a discount. Our Christmas specials are still running, I think, to the end of the year. At any rate, they're active today, so help us out today. Get a membership. We'll be back in just a moment after this short break. We were brought up loving our country and our Constitution. That in the United States of America, we were free. And that's an attitude that we've tried to instill in our children. I met my wife while uh, in the Air Force. I was a combat pilot in Vietnam. 
I served in Desert Storm as a commander. When I graduated from the academy, I took the oath of office. Uh, and as a commander, I administered that oath to many people. Now I, I wonder about the understanding people have of our Constitution, and I think about our candidates for President of the United States. Uh, it's interesting to see the support Ron Paul gets from the military. And if we think back to the code of conduct, uh, and people raising their right hand that they were going to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Why would those same people support in great numbers Ron Paul? I think it's because they know that he supports the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't mean you have to go to war to do it. Uh, it means you have to understand what the Constitution is and be a supporter inside of your own country, whether you're in the military or not of that Constitution and make the United States strong. And Ron Paul does that. That's his feeling, that's his thrust. And that's why if you look at the percentages that support him and the military, it's huge. Why is that? Because they've raised their right hands and they're putting their lives on the line for us here in the United States. And they know that Ron Paul does the same. We are back on the InfoWars Nightly News. We are joined now by Colonel Craig Roberts. As we showed you before the break, he appears in the film A Noble Lie, uh, a wonderful expose of the Oklahoma City false flag bombing. He's a retired Tulsa police officer. He was on the Fugitive Squad, the Bomb Squad, the police helicopter pilot. He was also an Army intelligence officer and a Marine Corps sniper in Vietnam, as well as an author of numerous books and has worked in TV. He joins us now to talk about the Oklahoma City bombing. Thank you, Colonel Roberts. Yeah, glad to be with you. Uh, now, for those who haven't seen the film, uh, give us an overview of what this film covers, and, and as we talked about before uh, this interview began, how there's so much more to the story than they could even put in this two-hour documentary. Well, yeah, there, it's, uh, uh, you know, I spent uh, eight years on the case myself, uh, six months while I was still a police officer and then after I retired I continued working on the case because there was just so much more out there that uh, didn't come before the public. Uh, the media wouldn't bring it up, wouldn't touch it with a stick. Uh, we chased so many leads, so many different directions. We know that there's a lot more people involved than just McVeigh and Nichols. Um, and uh, basically the bottom line uh, in the movie is uh, Charles Key, the rep state representative from Oklahoma that was real uh, involved in, in trying to get to the bottom of the bombing when it occurred back in 1995 and stayed with it for a while after that. And the Oklahoma uh, Bombing Investigation Commission that uh, was formed uh, that had several uh, different people involved in that, working on the case, most of them civilians. Uh, uh, the, the whole key there, the whole thing that they were trying to get out and put forth in the movie was proof that the government had foreknowledge that this was going to happen before it happened. There's so many things that led up to it. Uh, that we found out later. Uh, why was the uh, the Oklahoma County bomb, Sheriff's Office bomb squad at the building at 6 o'clock in the morning with a bomb truck? Why were there dogs there searching the area? Uh, why was the building staked out by the Sheriff's Office uh, prior to the rider's truck ever showing up? I've seen photographs of uh, a, a, from a stakeout camera of the front of the Murrah building where a UPS truck drives up just before nine o'clock in the morning right in front of the front door and they've got a picture of it. They're sitting there taking pictures of the building. UPS truck leaves and uh, then of course the rider truck shows up a little bit later. Um, so we know that that occurred at the time. Uh, we've got uh, you know, so many different eyewitnesses that saw Middle Easterners leave the, the front of the building uh, that held the parking place for the rider truck so McVeigh could pull it up. Uh, and there was other people in the rider truck. How many? We don't know because the uh, 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 FBI has never showed us any of the dozens of uh, surveillance videotapes that were taken at the scene. You know, you look at the, uh, the Kennedy assassination and at least you got the Zapruder film 
that uh, it, whether it's been doctored since then or not is irrelevant. The problem is we've got the Zapruder film. It was released to the public. Anybody can watch it and uh, see the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But yet we're not allowed to see any of the videotapes of the Oklahoma City bombing case. Now, if there's no others out there, if it was McVeigh and Nichols and, that's, and the case is closed, then show us the tapes. What's the problem? That's the Achilles heel of the whole case right there is the videotapes. There are so many aspects to this, tape, of this case, so many facets that uh, uh, you can explore that, that just don't make sense, or they do make sense, and, and you, you can't do anything with them. Uh, Jana Davis did a fantastic job. Uh, she was a reporter for uh, KFOR down there, Channel 4 TV Television News, and uh, she was uh, working on the Middle Eastern connections, all of the different people involved uh, that she had uh, you know, surveillance pictures of. She had, uh, they had, she had their names. Uh, she knew where they came from, who they worked for, the whole bit. And, and she got depositions, she got everything, and she couldn't give it to the FBI. She couldn't take, make the Justice Department even take all the evidence that she collected in this case. Uh, you know, I give her a lot of credit for doing a lot of work on this, and she ended up losing her, losing her job over it. She did such a great job that uh, uh, her station was bought out, and she was fired uh, just, to shut up, just to shut her up. Uh, it, 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 but the, going back to the beginning of this, uh, Charles Key's objective in it, when, and especially the, uh, the the folks that put this documentary together, the the thrust of it, the hook is is uh, did the government have foreknowledge of this in advance? Could it have been stopped? Was it a sting operation gone awry? Uh, how, who in the government knew? Uh, how much did they know? When did they know it? And how far in advance did they know it? And when you start getting to those aspects of the film. Uh, you can see all of the stuff that was turned up, or at least a lot of it. There's just so much out there. I've got, uh, when I retired, I had uh, five boxes of files on just this case uh, that went uh, all kinds of different directions. So the, 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 the documentary itself, which I was glad to help with, um, exposes so much that went on that was not in the mainstream news. In fact, uh, I was assigned the case uh, on the third day, on Friday uh, uh, that, of that week. It happened on a Wednesday, the 19th of April, 1995, and Friday afternoon I was asked by the local office of the FBI through our chief's office if I, if I could help them because as an investigative journalist, besides being a police officer, I had a lot of contacts that they didn't have. And because they didn't have those contacts and couldn't get those contacts or even buy those contacts, they wanted me to see what I could find out about the case, especially who was McVeigh, has he ever been to Oklahoma, if so, where's he been, who does he talk to, and so on and so forth. But it got bigger than that. I'm kind of like a pit bull. Once I get on a case, I'm going to let go of it. Mm -hmm. And I started just uh, going different directions all over the country with this case and finding out all kinds of things and ended up linking up with other investigative journalists and other police officers around the country and so on and so forth. And we started turning up stuff and I kept turning in all these reports and they just kind of disappeared into a black hole. Um, it, uh, it, just, it just got more bizarre and more bizarre. Well, in July of that year, I went out to California to visit my father. There was no news in California about the Oklahoma City bombing. There was no news out of state about the Oklahoma City bombing or the investigation. That, sure, there was news the day it happened and maybe one or two days after that, and then you, it was a, like a blackout across the country. Unless somebody was going to, to trial or unless somebody had just uh, been arrested or the elusive John Doe 2 that they said was this Todd Bunning who uh, rented a, a rider truck the day ahead of time, and it really wasn't him, so there really wasn't a John Doe 2, right. which was all hogwash. Uh, you know, unless it was something like that, nothing hit the news. So the rest of the country was, uh, it was a blackout. They were kept in the dark. So unless you go to some of the uh, books and some of the documentaries that have been filmed uh, since then and uh, that are available out there, you're not going to hear anything about it unless you come on the Alex Jones show or, you know, uh, some other talk radio show where somebody that's been in, working on the case is, is willing to appear. Well, well, Colonel Roberts, I know you've probably covered a lot of this in your past appearances, but a lot of people are watching A Noble Life for the first time. I know for me it was a real primer into the detailed kind of overview because uh, I missed a lot of that when it originally happened. But can you talk about some of the other threats to police officers? We had uh, Don Browning, who's also on the, in the film. Uh, there's a, a large section on Terrence Yankee, uh, too, who I know you profiled and, and the terrible uh, treatment he was given. Can you talk about those threats? I mean, that's more than just prior knowledge. That's uh, intimidating, torturing, killing uh, police and other first responder witnesses who had uh, relevant knowledge to this case. Well, uh, Don Browning is a good friend of mine. Don was uh, 
fantastic police officer. Uh, uh, he was, it was toward the end of his career. He was a canine sergeant at the time, and he was one of the first two in the building, as from, from what I understand, him and Terry Aikie, and looking for, you know, victims that were still alive, uh, trying to do the best they could. And, and uh, Don saw damage inside the building that, that, that wasn't reported anyplace else. He saw uh, damage in the back of the building, what they call the pit, where it went down two or three floors uh, inside what was had been the parkade, where there were other explosives had been uh, had had, de- had detonated inside the building, and that's always left out. They don't want anybody to know that. They think they want everybody to think it's Lee Harvey McVeigh with the with a truck bomb, and that was it. When uh, all that was was a diversion. Uh, the actual explosives were inside the building. That's what brought down what what uh, the major major damage in there. Don saw all this stuff, and he kept trying to tell people about it. And his own chain of command tell, told him to shut up. Don't talk about this stuff. And then, of course, the feds uh, came and, and, and leaned on him and said, you need to back off of this. You know, things could happen. I think they even threatened, said, told him that if he didn't shut up, he, that, that he, he could die. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, they weren't that blatant with me. Uh, with me, they tapped my phone. They tapped my fax machine. They followed me. They tapped my office phones at the police department. Um, and I knew all the stuff because I had gear that, that, that showed when, you know, there, were, there was something on the line. I had fun with it. I, uh, I had a great time with it myself. They didn't intimidate me. I just don't scare you. See, after, you know, I've been in the Marine Corps in Vietnam and all the stuff I've been through, uh, you know, I just didn't scare it. So it didn't bother me. Uh, you know, my, my deal was if you're going to do something to me, bring your own body bags and bring your lunch because it's going to take a while. And that's, you know, that's just the way I am. So they, they didn't try that tact with me. Uh, but with, with Terry Yankee, on the other hand, that was a whole different deal. Uh, Terry, I, now I never knew Terry. I never met him. I found out about uh, all of this later on. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, <laughs> but he uh, he was a sergeant on the police department in Oklahoma City, and he was <clears throat> I think he was the first one first one in the building. And uh, he was he didn't like what he saw. He I, I don't know exactly what he saw in the building, but I suspect he saw possibly some charges that did not go off because. Um, uh, one of the ladies, uh, uh, Jane Graham, who worked there, had gone to work, at, I think it was a day or two uh, before that, and saw uh, who she thought was Andrea Strassmeyer mm-hmm. and uh, two other guys in the basement of the building putting putty on the columns and stringing what she thought was telephone wire between them. And to me, it sounds like it was probably composition C4 and dead cord uh, <clears throat> that they were stringing on the columns inside the building. And they were wearing GSA coveralls uh, as, as camouflage. Uh, so, so later on, we find out that, uh, you know, uh, not all the charges probably went off and maybe Don Browning uh, saw the damage and Terrence Jakey saw some of the charges. I don't know, but I'm just, that's a theory I've, I have. But whatever it was he saw, he kept trying to tell people about, and he was told by his own chain of command, stay off this, it's a federal deal, you don't want to do this, back off, uh, you know, just forget the whole thing, and he just wouldn't do it. And so he was accumulating evidence. Uh, you know, he's getting statements from witnesses. He was talking to people that, that were that were survivors and things like that. His his, his apartment was broken into. Uh, uh, he he uh, he was being followed around. And on one particular night, um, uh, one particular afternoon, he, he was supposed to have dinner with a friend of his. And he called him up and said, "Listen, I've got to run some stuff out to my mini storage in El Reno." And he said. Uh, uh, when I get done with that, I'll, I'll come back and we'll go to dinner as soon as I shake these two feds that are following me. So uh, for some reason, he thought that there were two federal agents following him, probably, you know, in, in a, some sedan or something, wearing sunglasses. I don't know. <clears throat> but he was under the impression that they were following him. And he never came back. Uh, no one heard from him again. And uh, he, he was found the next day. Near the El, not not far from the El Reno uh, Federal Reformatory in a field out in the middle of a field, uh, his car had been abandoned on on the on a on a side road there. There was blood in the car. The car was locked up. Uh, they found a knife um, uh, up up uh, up where the heater would be up under the under the uh, the dashboard. Uh, why why would you why would you use a knife and then hide it unless you were you were doing something to somebody else? Because they wrote this whole thing up as a suicide when they found his body. Mm. When they found his body out in the middle of this field we had to go through a bar ditch and a barbed wire fence and they get out in the middle of this field he had slash marks inside his wrists slash marks inside both elbows one on each side of his neck he had uh, 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 rope burns around his neck or ligature marks around his neck and he had handcuff marks on his on his wrist 
uh, and then he, he was shot, and he'd been beaten and tortured, and he'd been shot from the upper uh, side of his head down through the lower jaw, and there was no hardly any powder burns. There was no there was a contact wound with hardly any powder burns, which tells me it's probably a silencer or a sound suppressor, because that that's where the powder would go instead. Well, obviously not a suicide. <laughs> It was that, and who shoots themselves at a downward angle anyway? You know, you go into your chin, you go in your mouth, go through your head, but you don't get uncomfortable before you kill yourself. And uh, I've got these diagrams, by the way, on my website. If somebody wants to go to Rifle Warrior, that's rifle isn't gun, warrior isn't soldier, all one word, riflewarrior.com, and scroll down to the Baker Street Irregulars, go to that and click on the on Terrence Yakey's case. And all those diagrams are there. The, the, the death certificate written up as a suicide in the whole bit. Interestingly enough, it, and it was a small caliber gun, probably a 32. Well, he was supposed to carry, I think, a Glock 40 or a 9 millimeter. I can't remember which they had issued back in those days. But whatever it was, there was no gun found at the scene. The gun turns up later. And uh, uh, I'm not even sure it was if it was his service uh, pistol or not. But... Um, the family wasn't even notified until later on. And when they were notified, did they send a police car over to get his mother? No. Did they send anybody over to do anything for the family? No. They, uh, uh, if, you, if you get the DVD, uh, uh, A Noble Lie, they interview Taron Shakey's mother. They go into this case, and it's, yeah. it's very interesting to see all of the different things that happened at that time down, down in the Oklahoma City area. But he was murdered. It was written up as a suicide, plain and simple. And there were so many others that had mysterious... Uh, deaths uh, around the Oklahoma City bombing and, and right afterwards. Uh, if you get on the internet and just type in Oklahoma City murders or Oklahoma City suicides or Oklahoma City bombing deaths, uh, you can bring up a string of them. There's Dr. Chumley. Uh, he was the doctor that was on the scene that set up and uh, with kind of a first aid station, was treating people there. And the ATF agents came up and, and wanted him to be, wanted to be treated and told him that they were, you know, they had been in this elevator and the elevator fell and all that. And they found out later the elevator never fell and they were never in it. They weren't even in the building when this thing went down. But he was telling everybody these guys weren't hurt and they were not in the building when this happened. Well, he was on a hunt. And not long uh, after that, he was on a, uh, a hunting trip with some friends and they went out, flew in his Cessna 210 airplane out to New Mexico and they were flying back. Weather was clear, nothing wrong with anything. And the airplane, all of a sudden, uh, over Shamrock, Texas, spirals straight down into the ground and kills them all. Uh, and there was nothing wrong with the airplane. It wasn't instrument conditions or anything. And the FAA uh, said, well, it, you know, the only thing they could think is maybe he was the only one that knew how to fly and he had a heart attack and no one knew how to pull the airplane out of the dive. <clears throat> we'll never know because the, the wreckage was so bad. Yeah. But, uh, you know, bottom line is, is that... Uh, 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 there were so many after that, you know, so many different different witnesses, uh, you know, uh, disappeared, killed, you know, so on, so on, so forth. Uh, sir, shifting gears, where does the larger story point? We know there's the whole Elohim City element with all these infiltrators, Andy Strassmeyer, intelligence, super intelligence, whatever. Uh, the Jesse Trinidad document showed the SPLC. Uh, on phone calls with McVeigh and other people inside the Elohim City compound. And then you have the political elements with Holder and Reno and all the ATF people. And they're still at it today, many of them, uh, pursuing other false flags for political motives. Where does this larger story point, sir, if you could point us in the right direction? Well, it gets real interesting because it's like going into a building with a lot of different hallways. It just depends which one you want to go down. And it's all got the same front door and the same back door, but the hallways go off in a labyrinth. It's a maze in there. Mm -hmm. um, what I couldn't understand is we had uh, on day three, day four, and day five, uh, of course, they'd got McVeigh by then, and they put him in jail. Uh, and all the eyewitnesses were pointing to these Middle Eastern males wearing blue jogging suits that were in front of the building that ran off and jumped into a brown GMC pickup and raced away from the building just, just as the truck pulled up and so on and so forth. We are following Middle Eastern connections all over the place. The APBs that were coming out had to do with Middle Easterners, uh, you know, Arab types. Uh, then all of a sudden, on Sunday, the whole game changed. Uh, the FBI raids uh, uh, Nichols' brother's farm, Jim, James Nichols, up in Michigan, and uh, didn't find anything up there. They searched the place, didn't find anything. Uh, they've got Nichols now. He's turned himself in in Harrington, Kansas. Um, and uh, we had absolutely nothing to go any direction except to McVeigh and these Middle Easterners. Uh, 
that he was that, that he was somehow connected to. We didn't know how right at that particular time. And then all of a sudden, the media d does this launch on Michigan on Nichols' brother's farm, and all of a sudden, the whole case changed. Uh, Bill Clinton stands up and he makes a statement: "There is no Middle Eastern connection." Period. Okay, wait a minute. That's all we've got is Middle Eastern connections. What's going on here? And that's when the media launched off on the right wing, conservative radio talk show host, the militias, and so on and so forth. And uh, I couldn't understand where they were getting all this. Where's, where's all this coming from? This may be the natural enemy of the Clintons, and it may be the natural enemy of the, the left wing and the communist and the Marxist and all that, that nonsense. Uh, but they're not involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, we haven't got one thing pointing that direction right now. Uh, and, there, you know, the FBI asked me, I said, do you think any militias are involved in this? I said, no. I said, if, if there was a militia around here and they knew the federal building was going to be bombed, they would have guarded it. Now, if it was the U.N. building, that'd be a different story. I'd start looking that direction. But not, not a federal building, you know, a public building. That's like, you know, blowing up the post office. Uh, who wants to do that? There's, there's something else involved here, and something's not right, because all we have is Middle Eastern connections. We don't have anything pointing that direction, but the FBI all of a sudden shut down its investigation of any lead that went to a Middle Eastern connection, and they started focusing on militias, the NRA, uh, right-wing radio talk show host, uh, right, uh, as Charles Schumer said, right-wing radicals, that, all this kind of stuff. We had nothing going there, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then, uh, you know, a couple of months into this thing, uh, my, my FBI contact guy that I was supposed to be working with uh, called me up and he said, hey, have you ever heard of a place called Elohim City? And I said, Elohim City? What's that? He said, it's a place in Oklahoma. I said, well, I've lived here 40 years and I've never heard of it. And he said, no, it's supposed to be some kind of community in Oklahoma. Well, he knew a lot more about it than he was being honest with me about. I, I think he just wanted to know if I'd ever heard of it or knew anything about it. And I never had. I had to research it myself to figure out what it was. And it's nothing. It's just a group of houses out in the middle of nowhere woods on the Arkansas border, just inside of Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, it's a, basically one family uh, down there, the Millars, uh, and, and, so, and uh, you know, mostly relatives. And they got this little Christian identity community thing going. But the odd man out on the whole deal was Andrea Strassmeyer. And then I stumbled onto another deal about Elohim City. There was a guy named Dennis Mahon. I knew who Dennis Mahon was, and he knew me. He was a local uh, Tulsa character. He was the Grand Wizard of the KKK in Tulsa, you know, a few years before that. He was involved in all kinds of neo-Nazi stuff. He was a friend of uh, uh, the, the uh, war, the White Aryan Resistance, Metzger up in uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. Uh, and, you know, he knew all these characters. Uh, but he was mo mostly just talk. Uh, uh, Dennis Mahon, there's, there's two of them, they're twin brothers, and Dennis was the radical one, and all he did was talk a lot. And they'd go to the Dairy Queen and have their, their KKK meeting with all six guys. I mean, it was no big deal. But I think probably by this time, Mahon was an informant for, for one of the federal agencies, probably the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, he, he was linking up with Strassmeyer. He was going down and visiting Strassmeyer at LOM City. And, I, of course, I didn't know who Strassmeyer was at the time, but we found out later that uh, his dad was a, a secretary for Helmut Kohl, who was the chancellor of Germany or assistant chancellor, whatever it was. And um, uh, Strassmeyer was in the Panzer Grenadiers as an intelligence officer. And uh, at the time, Germany was having a real ba uh, bad time uh, trying to deal with, with you know, an emerging neo-Nazi movement that was happening in Germany. And I think that they sent Strassmeyer over here to try to infiltrate the American end of this because a lot of the materials they were getting, a lot of the, the Nazi symbology and all the different things, the accoutrements and stuff, were being shipped to Germany from America because they, they, weren't, they weren't even supposed to have it over there and they sure couldn't buy it. And, and Mahon was involved in all of that. I think he was supplying Strassmeyer with stuff, thinking Strassmeyer is a good German neo-Nazi that came over here. And Strassmeyer uh, was an informant for... Uh, 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 somebody, and we just weren't sure who at the time. FBI swore it wasn't them, but that was the local FBI. It wasn't until a, quite a while later that the Southern Poverty Law Center connection came up, which brings Morris Dees into it. And because uh, they got linked into this deal, all of a sudden the lights started going on for me. And I'm going, wait a minute. We were after the Middle Easterners until Sunday, then all of a sudden we're after the right wing and the militias. Now, who's the biggest guy uh, out there making money?
from selling newsletters called Militia Watch and writing books about the militia and the right wing and the militia movement, but Morris Deeds. He can make money off this deal. Well, he's got Strassmeyer evidently reporting to him or to the Southern Poverty Law Center, according to the documentation that's, that's, that's surfaced since then. And so that started to make sense, but let me tell you what didn't make any sense. Okay, let's say Strassmeyer's working for him. When it came time for someone to talk to Strassmeyer about his connection to McVeigh, LOM City, the bombing, and to uh, uh, Dennis Mahon, Stra Strassmeyer disappears. And somebody hides him and then smuggles him out of the country. But is it Morris Dees? No. It's Kirk Lyons. At the, at the, uh, at the Cause Foundation, which is in, in uh, uh, North Carolina, and he's the lawyer that is the alter ego, the exact opposite of Morris Dees. As far left as Morris Dees is, Kirk Lyons is supposed to be that far to the right. He defended the KKK in lawsuits against Morris Dees. And now he is uh, working to get Strassmeyer safely out of the country and back to Germany through Mexico. Now, what connection does that have? We got Strassmeyer working for both of them at the same time, or knows both of them at the same time. There's a connection there somewhere, and uh, no one really explored that or said a word about that. That would have been something I would have been all over like a dog on a chew bug, and it just didn't happen. So every time we get really hard, good evidence of something going on, it doesn't go anyplace. It's like Jan, uh, Janet Davis said, you know, who do you go to with this information if the people that are supposed to take it don't want it, won't touch it? You know, so who's involved? And then, of course, you know, uh, you know, with all this out, uh, uh, out on the table, we could always go into the Middle Eastern connection through Nichols, if you want to. Well, uh, we'll leave that for next time. But I do want to bring up uh, the potential for a next attack because we have Obama advisors, including Robert Shapiro, saying, I know you haven't seen the specific article, but you've probably heard similar calls for a way to boost his sagging popularity with a new 9-11 style or Oklahoma City attack. At the same time, you've got the SPLC and Homeland Security beating the drum for a domestic extremist, uh, right-wing extremist militia type threat uh, all throughout the Obama administration. Well, there are so many cans that they could open up and dump the worms out of right now. It's pathetic. Uh, you, can, you can go after the right wing. You can go after... Uh, uh, there really isn't any big militia movements left anymore. There's, there's little groups of people and little home defense groups that get together and individuals, what they call the lone wolf. And I mean, this whole country's on a powder keg right now. Everybody's tired of what's going on. There's people out there that are talking about picking up guns. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening all over the country. We know that. That's the atmosphere right now. Yeah. But what would set off a government uh, crackdown, for lack of a better word, uh, anything could. Uh, how about Israel and Iran getting into it? How about uh, us going into it with Iran blocking the Straits of Hormuz? Uh, we've got uh, uh, we've got biological terrorism still capable uh, of occurring in this country. Uh, we've got uh, all kinds of Middle Eastern terrorists bringing whatever they want across the Mexican border and the, and the Obama administration doing nothing about it. Uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, you remember the, the, the D.C. snipers, the two guys that run around a car just shooting people at random? Well, if you started that with, with, with Islamics or people dressed up to look like Islamics and just started right. shooting people around the country and, and swearing up and down, you know, taking credit as it's jihad, uh, then you would have the the the, uh, the 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 mainstream America against the Muslim community. Uh, no one would trust anybody. Blah blah blah. I mean, any pretext alone. If you had events like blowing up a train, uh, blowing up another airplane, uh, over not. I'm not talking about TWA turned over the water. I'm talking about over over the middle of the United States. You know, something like that, a jumbo jet. Uh, if you had um, uh, anything that would precipitate a TSA Homeland Security crackdown, it wouldn't take that much. Anything to do that. Any threat to the population that the media could play up on, such as biological or radiological, a dirty bomb someplace. Yeah, they take any pretext that sells. Any pretext. They've got a whole toolbox full of them. And the thing about it is, it could happen. And the reason it can happen is because it's happened before. The Amtrak derailment in Arizona, the Oklahoma City bombing, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, 9-11. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they've hit virtually every possible type of terrorist target. 
except a, 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 a ship at sea. And that happened with the Achille Loro, but, you know, that's how many people go out and ride a, a cruise ship compared to how many people go to the post office, how many people go to a clinic, how many people go to a sports stadium, how many people drink the water supply, how many people ride on airplanes. You know, you and I, you, the only way you can have terror is to have fear. The only way you can have fear is to have two things, an incident and media. If the incident happens and no one knows about it, it's not terrorism because no one's afraid. But if it happens and the media makes it uh, into a bigger deal than it is and it's everywhere, then we have fear. Then we have everybody demanding something be done. And when you demand that something be, is done, we end up with things like the, the 1995 uh, 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 Omnibus Crime Bill and the Patriot Act and and uh, so on and so forth. And then what do you do with the population? If you if you have an outbreak of something in a city, what do you do with the population? You've got to move them to a relocation center. Now, is that starting to sound a little bit familiar? Mm. Putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Well yeah. said, sir, and we appreciate you joining us. I hope we'll have you back on very soon to get even further into this case and everything that's happening in the modern day. Colonel Craig Roberts, Thank you for joining us tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, and we'll be back again tomorrow. So long and farewell.